So for my readings, I'm going to return to the book uh, Ajahn Chah's uh, Being Dharma, and uh, I don't know, I enjoy it, if anybody, I'm sure others find it useful as well. And I'm just going to continue on from where I uh, kind of stopped the last time. Tanha is craving. If we think things through like this, we can quell it. In the books, it's called craving. But in my meditation system, I call it open wide, open without shutting. Uh, what it, what is, 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 it's an idiom in Thai, uh, the word. Is, so it's, it, it's open wide, open without shutting. It's, it's <laughs> which is, is uh, <laughs> so the, the image is, is very, is very good. So it's, uh, just ready to sort of consume anything and take on anything. But that, uh, yeah, that the, the, you have to know where the, where the idiom comes from for it to make, make a bit more sense. And especially it's in 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 Isan. <laughs> okay, open without shutting. This is tanha in meditation practice. It is said there is no river equal to craving. I think that's a Dhammapada verse. Open wide without shutting. There is no end to suffering. Desire is not of the mouth or the stomach. They can be satisfied. If the stomach doesn't have enough. You can eat some rice. That which is tanha is not the stomach or mouth. Craving has no form or self. It is open wide. I've compared this to a dog. A dog is given some rice and eats it. One bowl, two, three, or even five. Its stomach will be full, but its craving is still there, open wide. Put some more rice in front of it, and it will lay there guarding it. If another dog shows up, it will growl. Grr. A chicken comes. Grr. This shows that the stomach is not the place of craving. The mouth is not the place of craving. They can be full. But the thinking and feeling that craves is continuously open wide. The Buddha thus said, There is no river like craving. If it is open like this, it can never be satisfied or filled. If it's closed... When you pour the water, it flows off. If it's open, the water goes in and never fills it. It just keeps on flowing in. It's like this, never satisfied, wanting all manner of things. Consider a person who is enamored of life and doesn't think about death. When they're ser serious Ill, that seriously ill, they moan and plead. Please give me a little more time. If you're going to take me, make it sometime in the future. Then they recover. They fall ill again and again beg. May I have a little time? Please don't take me yet. When we're healthy and strong, we don't think about death. We don't feel that we are in danger. Of course, we are not beyond danger because we haven't died. Then when we're sick, please, I need a little more time. It's not right to go now. This can happen many times, and still we say, Please, not yet, not just yet. The truth is, we are afraid. We don't want to die. That's all there is to it. It's a matter of blind craving, people being attached to life. This is an example of desire. If we don't develop wisdom to know this craving, we are always in a state of suffering. Tanha is called desire. It means not being satisfied. That's a better way to put it. Someone can be free of tanha. They will still have desires, but they, can be, but they can be satisfied. Tanha cannot be satisfied. We carry it along and complain all the way. We complain of the heaviness, but don't want to put down the heavy thing. If we want a lot of things, it gets really heavy. People want a lot, but they don't want it to be heavy. This is not seeking out the facts of the matter. If we understand, there isn't a whole lot to it. It's not a big deal. We can get to the end. I think Dhamma is something difficult. It's troublesome. But if we really contemplate it, 
it is something that can, that can make an end of our problems. The things the Buddha taught are not impossible to practice. Among all the things the Buddha taught, that which is beyond being practiced by people does not exist. He only taught that which benefits us and benefits others. Things that are of no benefit to us and others, he did not teach. Please consider this. If suffering occurs in your daily life, you should consider why this is happening. It might be that your children don't listen to you. Well, who made these children? If you are suffering because of your children, actually the cause resides with you. You have to think like this, returning to the origin. If you just want to try to fix the situation by forcing them to be a certain way, it will be beyond your means. You won't be able to accomplish it, and you'll end up in tears over your children. In truth, what is the reason? There's a cause. You have to pay attention and see what it is. Things don't just bubble up and appear without cause, but we don't really search it out very seriously. The Buddha taught us to realize that the world is like this. He could find peace because he knew things according to the truth. What is this about? Let's use an analogy. Have you ever seen monkeys? Are they calm and peaceful? Are there any calm monkeys? That's the way monkeys are, climbing around all the time. Wherever there are monkeys, they act that way. But maybe you get upset when you see them. You feel they should sit still and not be climbing and jumping all over. It might make you so angrier, angry you're even ready to kill them. But have you ever seen a tranquil monkey, one that can be still, the way we can train humans to meditate and behave calmly? There's no such thing, apart from a monkey that is dead. So what should you do? Should you try to force them to be otherwise? You should realize that this is just the way monkeys are. Every monkey in the universe will carry on like this. If you see one and understand it clearly, you know all monkeys. You will let it, let it be what it is, because that is the way of monkeys. Whether or not the monkey is calm, your own feeling about it is another matter. And that can be calm. Let monkeys be monkeys without getting emotionally involved. Peace can be born within because you know the way monkeys are. Knowing the manner of monkeys, you will let go and be at peace, not getting tied up in monkey business. You see them and realize monkeys are like that. You go somewhere else and see monkeys, and you think, monkeys are like that. There's no ill will on your part, because monkeys are like that. That's all. It was probably at that time there was a monkey at Wapapong, and it used to get into everything. It was... <laughs> <coughs> But you want monkeys to be calm, and so you reap suffering. That is not how the Buddha wanted you to resolve things. You should resolve them by knowing according to the truth. If you keep looking into it, you will come to realize that it is beyond your ability to alter things. So you have to release them, let go. Wisdom knows the way phenomena are, knowing they are thus, and letting them be thus, brings peace to the mind. There will be no doubt. The world is the same. The Buddha is said to be the one who knows the world clearly, just as we know monkeys clearly. The world has to be like that. Usually people come to recognize this because nature has ripened for them. They have had a lot of experiences. Then they may hear just a little Dhamma, and they look back with great regret. Oh, I've been suffering for so many years just because I wanted to make things a certain way. And not just many years, it's possible to go on until you die if you keep thinking in the same old way and don't let go. You will never see the place of peace. You will never see the place where you can let go. Things are a certain way, but you want them to be otherwise, and it can't happen. Whatever is the truth of phenomena, that is what you need to see. And this goes into a set of questions and answers, and somebody asks, Suppose a monkey starts playing with fire. If we just let it be the way it will be, it could burn down our house. Ajahn Cha. No, no, it's not like that. That's a different matter. We know monkeys, and we should have greater wisdom than monkeys. 
Will you let them get hold of fire and burn down your house? When there is a crisis, you will know how to deal with it. For example, everyone has to die, but still we take care of our lives. But taking care of it the way you doctors do, curing and controlling illness, not to prevent death. There is no such thing. There is no such medicine. If you know this, you care for your patients and treat illness like this. Maybe a criminal comes to the hospital. He was involved in a robbery and got shot. The hospital has to take care of him. Some will then say that the doctors are supporting a thief, saving him so he can go rob houses. It's not like that. It's the responsibility of the doctors to take care of people. If you take care of them, and when they recover, they go and commit crimes, that's not your fault. You take care of people according to your function and responsibility as doctors. It's not that you are treating them to continue their career as criminals. You are only doing your duty to relieve suffering and treat illness and injury. When people get sick, they rush to find a doctor. Likewise, if a monkey is about to set our house on fire, we will do something to stop it. We have to take care of things and employ caution. <clears throat> but speaking of our house, we don't need a monkey to burn it down. There is already the demon living there. We don't need to take care of it. Having been born, people must die. So why should we take care of our lives? There is this question. And that was a sort of a, in, in quotation marks, like somebody, and um, Paul making it into a, a, a quote of somebody. We don't need to take care of it. Having been born, people must die. So why should we take care of our lives? There is this question. We should take care of our lives just as doctors treat sick people to get some temporary relief. Worldly people always complain, saying things like, these doctors are no good. They treated me, but I didn't get better. Furthermore, you can see that people are always dying. They indulge in this kind of mad talk. Doctors do not treat people to prevent death. They don't have medicine to prevent death. No matter what level of study they go through, they never learn such a thing. That is not the province of doctors. Their responsibility is to alleviate suffering from illness and help people survive one day at a time. That's all. So that's called not letting the monkey burn down your house. We have to use wisdom to take care of things. When we know what monkeys are all about, if a monkey is bringing fire to the house, will we just sit by and watch? We know the traits of monkeys, and we are able to watch out for them and exert control, just like with children. We have to know their ways, and we have to take care of them. If we know how children are, we will watch over them carefully. They could burn or cut themselves or fall into di ditches. We can't just leave them to themselves. Someone who employs equanimity here is not someone who understands children. Someone like that will let the monkey burn down the house. You may feel that living at home is troublesome, but when you leave for a while, you start to feel homesick. What should you do? It's strange, isn't it, the way of humans? It's only because when you go somewhere, you don't really reach the place of satisfaction. Your thinking doesn't get there. This is what the Buddha called the cycle. So you come to this monastery for training to do something worthwhile, but the feeling is still not the same as being at home. No place can be as pleasant and enjoyable as home for you. So you're always thinking of home. It means that the business of good and evil is not yet finished. You are still doing things in a worldly way, so it isn't finished. If it isn't finished, it means you haven't put things down. If you have not put them down, you are still carrying them. Carrying them, you feel the heaviness, and you can see the fault of it. It comes down to practicing patient endurance. There isn't really anything to it. It is said that patience is the mother of all Dhamma. Patience brings good results, but then... When good comes, we're often deluded by it. Strange, isn't it? We should be able to reach a conclusion to all of this. Things are good, but we get deluded. Then there is more suffering. Good and evil, love and hate, don't go beyond, but always remain within their limitations. 
We really ought to think about the Dhamma and internalize it to resolve these matters. If we are suffering, we expect another person to cure it for us. But this is not something another person can do. They can explain the path for curing suffering, only that. The matter of really ending ending suffering is something to be accomplished personally. The Supreme Teacher said, The Tathagata is only the one who points out the way. He tells you to pick this up from here and put it there. Pick this up from there and put it here. He teaches you how to swim. It's not that he swims for you. If you want the Tathagata to swim for you, you're only going to drown. Last year, some officials came here for a meeting to learn, quote-unquote, the right way. Why? Because things were not going well, and they didn't feel good about it. So they came to learn about right understanding. But to get beyond feeling good when things seem right and suffering over things not going well is something not generally understood. The world is like this. Toward the sufferings we create, the heaviness, we need to have some patience and endurance. We know things are heavy, but we have desire, so we pick them up. They will be heavy, so then we really have to endure. When we were students, we saw adults and thought how happy they must be. We saw them doing all kinds of things, people such as teachers, merchants, employers, or administrators, and we wanted to be like that. So we worked at our studies with the hope of becoming just like them. But now that we are in the same positions... We don't really have such great <coughs> We don't really have such great happiness, do we? The suffering and difficulty are still there. We haven't escaped from that condition of unsatisfactoriness. We haven't escaped now, and we don't really know if we can escape in the future. Things just keep getting heavier as we go along. This place is called the world. World or loko in Pali, means darkness. However much the world progresses and develops, darkness develops just that much. The progress of the world is just the progress of darkness. People talk enthusiastically about how the world is progressing, but it is only darkness spreading. In our monastery, we previously had no electricity. People used to say, It's really dark here. How comfortable it would be if we had electricity, if we had running water. But these things didn't appear by themselves. They take a considerable investment of money. The ability to get them comes from difficulty. And then when we do have the bright electric lights, it actually enshrouds the mind and darkens it further. Convenience covers the mind in darkness because it is the nature of people to want everything the easy way. The easier and more convenient things are, the lazier people get. In the past, when the country was not materially developed, people would build their toilet way out in the forest, and they would have to make some effort to walk out there and use it. Now this can't be done. People won't go out. Wherever they sleep, there must be a toilet right there. I don't know what they want. Does that really bring well-being? The bedroom is here and the bathroom is here too. People expect this will make for convenience and happiness, but it isn't really so. Being too comfortable just leads to heedlessness, and people want to take it much further than this. But there is never any satisfaction. It's never enough. And then they complain about their suffering. Speaking of the way we we make use of our resources, mostly we feel that we don't have enough money to get by. What should we do to make it enough? It seems to me <clears throat> there is so much money, but it's never, never enough. That's why I say there are no rich people. At least I've never seen any. I only see people who feel they don't have enough. The Buddha talked about earning and spending money. Earning is not so hard. The way we use it is what's really important. We should earn our living in a way that is right livelihood. Having earned money, we should make the best use of it, conserving it for meaningful ends. Whatever you may need, don't let it go to excess. The Buddha taught extensively about this, but we don't really pay heed. 
Whatever we see others getting, we want to match them. However much we earn, we are ready to spend. Suffering. Who created it? We don't see. We see it is for this or that reason, but we never point at the source. The root is here, but we are looking all over for it, blaming people and situations, so it doesn't become very clear. We don't really get down to it. We just look at things outside ourselves and are always trying to manipulate externals. We can look around and see when the house is not clean. We can see when the dishes are dirty. We can clean them up. Then the house is clean, the dishes are clean, but still the mind is not clean. When the house is a mess, we will probably feel uncomfortable and get to sweeping, washing, and so forth. The mind is dark and unpleasant, yet we don't see ourselves. <clears throat> so we go on complaining about our terrible suffering. When you think about it, we are really pretty pitiful. If we could put effort into cleaning up our minds the way we do sweeping our houses, washing and scrubbing our clothes and doing the dishes, we would likely be at ease. But when we talk about cleaning like this, people don't know what we're getting at. It's just like someone being indifferent to whether the dishes are clean or dirty. It's an ignorant kind of indifference. We have to go to work and clean, otherwise we never reach the correct point and the mind remains in this befouled, ignorant condition. The Buddha spoke of this as the mind not striving to see clearly, but just following its inclinations and tendencies. In our vernacular, we say, following moods. In our families, today we feel love, tomorrow dislike. Today we love our children, but the next day we are exasperated and upset with them. Why is it like this? Why is it not stable? It means that the mind hasn't been trained. Love causes suffering to arise. Aversion causes suffering to arise. Too little and we suffer. Too much and we suffer. Where can we stay? Have you sought your dwelling place yet? Find the right place to stay. How many months and years have passed when you should have been seeking and building the place where you can be at peace, yet you are still in this condition? What is the reason? A husband and wife live together. There's really no reason they should quarrel. But quarrel they do, even to the point where one of them will get up and leave in the night, though they are likely to come back the next day. It's troublesome, really. I've come to think it's because people don't seek their true dwelling place. We don't clean in the place that really needs it. We scrub and sweep elsewhere. We don't make our minds clean so there's always confusion. We're always looking outside. The Buddha taught about turning inward. Turn inward to look at the mind, to see what is in the mind. But these days there, there are only force and hurry. Mangoes are never sweet now. They are forced. Before they're ripe, they are picked and artificially ripened. This is done because people want to get them in a hurry. So when you eat them, you find they are sour. It's trying to match the desires of people to get things in a hurry. To get something good, something sweet, you have to let it be sour first, according to its own natural way. But we pick them early and then complain that they're sour. For the most part, things are imitations. We grasp these things that are false and uncertain as real. The Buddha wanted us to see that which is not false but genuine, but these days, understanding is almost completely mistaken. People don't know anything about whether things are real or false. When, and when it's like this, all kinds of perceptions occur. Things that are false and contrived are taken for real. In this vein, the Buddha taught about turning inward to see. If the Buddha does not see and realize, there is, if the mind does not see and realize, there is no path to clarity. The Buddha said that one who is a teacher, like me, can end up as a hungry ghost. A refined sort of hungry ghost. How is this? There's a story I'd like to tell, a fable that's worth nar narrating. It's a, little, it's a little long, so try to bear with me. There was a person who had a very virtuous mind. Whatever was meritorious and skillful, he would strive to do that. Everything he did was refined and somewhat fastidious. Everything had to be neat, 
everything in its place. When his children, nieces, or nephews came to visit, he would get a little unhappy. The broom that belonged over here would be left over there. The kettle would not be put back where it was supposed to be. If anyone didn't do things his way, he would suffer. But he was a refined person with a good orderly mind. One day, he thought about building a pavilion in the forest, a sala, a hall where people could take shelter. Hmm, building a sala here would be a good thing. I would accrue merit. Merchants and travelers could stop and rest here. They would be comfortable and appreciate it greatly. Having thought about this, he went ahead and built it, and people made use of it. Later, he passed away. After he died, because of his, his attachment to his virtuous activity, his consciousness returned to reside in that place, the place where he used to live and do his good deeds. He would check out the sala and see whether it was being kept up. When he found parts that were messy, he would be upset. And when he saw that it was neat and clean, he was happy, because his mind was like that, virtuous, neat, and orderly. Then one day, several hundred merchants came to stay there. After taking dinner, they went to sleep, lying down in long rows. The owner of the hall was now this refined, hungry ghost. He came to check whether they were sleeping in orderly fashion. Patrolling up and down, looking around, he noticed their heads weren't lined up straight. What to do? He thought it over then pulled their feet to line up, the, line up their heads evenly. He kept on pulling and tugging, this row and the next row and the next one, until he had them all adjusted right. But then he looked at their feet. Now their feet were out of line. What to do now? So he started pulling the heads up to align the feet. Once that was finally accomplished, he saw that the heads were out of line again. What's the story here, anyhow, he wondered. He went on like this through the night, bothered the whole time. Finally, he gave up, asking himself what, what the reason was for this. He sat down and thought and saw the light. People are not the same. Their heights differ, so they can't be lined up straight. He then let go of the matter, because he saw that some were short and some were tall. That is just the way it is. He let go, and he felt better because he saw that people aren't the same. Before, he had expected them all to be the same. When they weren't, he tried to make them, he tried to make them the same, but it was impossible, and he suffered for it. Then he stopped and contemplated the matter and saw the truth. Ah, people are like that. They are not the same height. And he felt better. It's similar for us. We have to see the causes of things. We have to see that people are not all the same. This is something worth pondering, because we can't change certain things. It won't do to cut. It won't do to go cutting off their legs just to make them even. Grasping gets us stuck in attachment to how we expect things to be. We people are like this. We have different work and responsibilities. Some will be fast and efficient, some slow, all sorts of differences. It's easy to become a hungry ghost if you view it wrongly. Me too. I can, be hung I can become a hungry ghost over this, though I become aware of it quickly. Hey, you're becoming a hungry ghost. Cut it out. I have my disciples, and I want them to improve, to develop by following our mode of training. Sometimes I suffer over this. When that happens, I remind myself, I become a hungry ghost again. I teach myself all the time like this. In this way, we can take birth as hungry ghosts often. We don't give up easily. We have to teach ourselves to become skilled in dealing with things, knowing the causes and results. Then we can let people be as they are. Let them do as they do. We let go and can be lighthearted about it. We may want them to be a certain way, but the problem is not because of them, it's because of us. Our own minds are obscured, so we think it is because of this or that person. That's not so, it's because of us. People are not the same, but we expect them to be the same. If we solve the problem of the way we see things, we will be, we will be all right. Someone rides a motorcycle, he loses control and goes down, then he'll say, 
The motorcycle made me fall. Actually, he made the motorcycle fall because he couldn't drive it well, but he says the motorcycle made him fall. I'll sum it up. For children and adults, the situation is different. If children do wrong, you can forgive them because they don't really know anything. If adults do wrong, people don't want to forgive because they should know better. The Buddha said that someone who doesn't know right from wrong can be taught to know. Someone who knows but doesn't act accordingly is hopeless. The person is called heedless and cannot really be taught. People end up miserable only because they don't look at themselves. We're always looking at other things and people, looking outside for something that is attractive, trying to make externals pleasing. We never dig internally, never work on ourselves, and become bright and clear. The result can only be constant difficulty and confusion. Wherever we look, there is darkness. Why? Because the eyes are not good. We complain of the dark. We cannot see light and color, so we say they could not possibly exist. Okay, that's true for the blind, but actually we are upset for nothing. The problem is in the eyes. Nothing is seen clearly, neither light nor color. But if the eyes are good, those things appear and we will know know what they are. We don't really examine this problem. Mostly we look elsewhere so we don't have happiness. We should learn how to make this life of ours joyous. There really are things that can make that happen. So I'll leave it there. Any questions, comments? Long Pa, in the Sangyuta Nikaya, there is a, a sutta called uh, Sun's Flesh. Yes. It has uh, four similes. Yep. And uh, the first simile is more or less clear, but the other similes really... I'm not explained at all, I think, in the sutta. And uh, I wonder if you could explain them uh, just briefly, may- maybe. The, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember what, what the second simile is, the simile of the... Flayed the flay, yes, right, the flayed cow. Right, right so, the, so when a, the, the flayed cow is, uh, I mean, flayed means to have the external skin taken off. So, very sensitive, because that's all about feeling and contact. And so that, that uh, yeah, when your, your skin is, is peeled off, then you're extremely sensitive. Uh, so that sensitivity to feeling and pain and, and, and pleasure and, and neutral feeling. Uh, so that, that, that image is, is, is quite stark. The other, Im- the third image is about the the person being carried to a pit of coals, and how, and and that is, uh, the the mind, the the mental mental formation, the mano uh in Pali, they say intentions and volitions of the mind, the movement of the mind. And so that that when one is is being carried to a a, a burning pit of coals, um, that that sense of because uh, it's for those are for that's for understanding the sense of the image is for understanding desire and seeing the the different forms of of desire, and so that. Trying to pull away from the you know, being thrown into a pit of coals, every anybody would would try to try to get out of that. Uh, so it's 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 not a not a comfortable place, but we get pulled in because of our desire. Uh, and then the last one is the, uh, the magician. Yeah. Oh, the arrows! Right, 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 right. Yes, so that the uh, yeah that that sense of you know, consciousness, just being conscious of anything, is is being constantly getting the whole process moving every time because it's consciousness with ignorance and craving as a, as the root, with delusion as a, as a basis, so that whenever as long as we're we are still subject to 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 delusion. Uh, then we are you know, recreating the whole process for 
for consciousness and, and contact and the, the whole sense of mind-body process. And if I, recall, if I recall correctly, that sutta so is comparing the four types of nutriment with those similes. Yes. So yeah, it's like edible food. Yeah, I mean, it's the things that when you say nutriment, it's the things that give kind of a certain sus that one's seeking sustenance in something. So then the, the, uh, the sort of material food as a sustenance, but then it's, it's the, uh, what is understood and understood is, is, is the, six, the, is the uh, five chords of sensual desire. And so that when one see, when, what, what, what is one feeding off of? So one's feeding off of the objects of desire. What is one feeding off in, in the flayed cow is, the, is feeling. Uh, what is one feeding off in in the you know this uh, the the mental movement uh, feeding off of consciousness? One is seeking sustenance and 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 sustaining oneself and one's sense of being with these different objects of attention. And is the Buddha saying that uh, all those uh, forms of nutriment are by those similes saying this is suffering, this is painful? You should try to, you know, find an end to those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But in the same way that that uh, you 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 still rely on you still rely on material food, just learning how to to be wise in how you consume and and eat and not get not get obsessed and caught up. Uh, so the same with feeling and mental states and consciousness.